more than 50 million at risk right now. No Overnight, this tornado tore through South Bend, Indiana, destroying a daycare center. And lightning knocked out power at a major airport, a flash flood emergency in Missouri, neighborhoods underwater, where the storms are heading next now. Happening now, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arriving in the Middle East just moments ago as Iran issues a new threat this morning. Crisis at the border. The president calls off sweeping immigration rates for now after a plea from Nancy Pelosi. This as new details emerge about the migrant children being held in those camps. One doctor who went inside compares them to, quote, torture facilities. ABC News exclusive, out of control. The hot air balloon crashing into a crowd. Now the passenger revealing what the pilot did to prevent a catastrophe. This is the one two comes home and Bellinger. Danger at the ballpark. Another fan hospitalized, hit in the head by a Dodgers foul ball. She was sitting just outside that protective netting. And high wire heroes, Nick and Liana Walenda pulling off an incredible stunt, 25 stories above Times Square. The heart pounding moment they crossed each other on live TV. I'm gonna do this. What do you think, New York City? And now the exclusive behind the scenes footage you haven't seen. And wait till you hear what's next. Their first interview right here on GMA. I kept on falling short of something. Good morning, America. Times Square, always full of surprises, but nothing like last night. Michael, you were there for all of it. How terrifying was it? I, I did not sleep last night, George. I think it was Nick and Liana are the only ones who slept. They were calm. It was it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen and, and a testament to getting past your fears. They are here today. Cannot wait to talk to them, but wow, I did not sleep. You, you didn't Still want to get shaking. up there with them? You, you get up there. I was wire. standing on the building scare. <laughs> To get on a wire. Well, as you just said, Nick Willenda and his sister were more than 200 feet above ground. It was mm. incredible walking on a wire. You guys, listen to this, just three quarters of an inch wide. And they revealed some clues about what's coming up. We'll get all of those details when they're heard live. Talking to you not too long. Yeah, and you guys can try it. They left the wire up. There, so. <laughs> no, I doubt know. that's going to happen. But, you know, we're going to move on, guys. We're going to first start. We're going to begin with those dangerous storms that are on the move, bringing twisters and flash flooding to the Midwest. Oh. Now 50 million are bracing that the system is heading east. Ginger starts us off with the very latest. Good morning, Ginger. Michael, amazing images coming in from South Bend, Indiana. Late last evening, people were in their cars. They were just leaving dinner. And this is what you end up seeing, a tornado right behind that CVS. This was one of more than 200 severe storm reports in just the last 24 hours. An up-close encounter with a tornado in South Bend, Indiana. Debris swirling in the violent twister right in front of the no driver of this way. car. No way. Watch this light flash behind the CVS before get the in, power goes out. Get in, get in. A daycare center in Elkhart, Indiana hit hard. Half the building unrecognizable. Thankfully, no one was inside and there were no injuries. South Bend mayor and 2020 presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg tweeting the city was assessing the damage and quote thankful that as of now no injuries have been reported. While Indiana dealt with that tornado, flights at both Dallas airports came to a temporary ground stop because of severe storms and a lightning strike cutting radio communication. The, uh, communication system for air traffic control has been restored. And at this marina in Gilbertsville, Kentucky, damaging winds wrecking these boats, piling them on top of each other. A flash flood emergency declared in southwest Missouri. A home once stood on this foundation before being swept away. Water filling the town of Anderson after six inches of rain fell in just six hours. And unfortunately, more of that to come. Severe thunderstorm warnings have been popping in Mississippi throughout the morning along this line. Now what will happen is the atmosphere will kind of settle down and then recharge for the afternoon and evening. And that's why anybody from Kentucky through West Virginia, Ohio, even eastern Michigan, down to north Georgia, needs to watch for damaging wind, hail, and yes, tornadoes today, George. Another rough day. Okay, Ginger, thanks very much. We're going to get the latest now on the crisis with Iran. That regime making new threats to down American drones as the White House prepares to unveil a new round of sanctions. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo now in Saudi Arabia for talks on building a coalition against Tehran. Our chief White House correspondent John Carl tracking these new developments. Good morning, John. 
Good morning, George. The president says he will impose those new economic sanctions later today as the Iranian military says it will strike again if any U.S. aircraft enters Iranian airspace. More defiance from Iran as a private Iranian news agency is quoting a top Iranian military official saying his forces are capable of shooting down more American drones. Although the president called off his planned military strike, ABC News has learned that the White House quietly greenlighted a cyber attack on Iran, disabling software on computer systems used to control rocket and missile launches. <laughs> this morning, Iran's foreign minister is saying that was, quote, a big mistake and is contrary to international law. President, president Trump says he made his last-minute decision to call off the military strike when he was told how many Iranians could die in the attack. Everybody was saying I'm a warmonger, and now they say I'm a dove. And uh, I think I'm neither, you want to know the truth. I'm a man with common sense. But I didn't like the idea of them knowingly shooting down an unmanned drone and then we kill 150 people. I didn't like that. The drone the Iranian shot down is a sophisticated surveillance aircraft that costs some $130 million. National Security Advisor John Bolton and Secretary of State Pompeo had urged the military strike to retaliate, but the president said he is not looking for war. John Bolton is absolutely a hawk. It's up to him. He'd take on the whole world at one time. You know, I was against going into Iraq. Bolton's tough talk took center stage again in Israel on Sunday. Neither Iran nor any other hostile actor should mistake U.S. prudence and discretion for weakness. The president says if it comes to war, the U.S. will, quote, obliterate Iran. But what he really wants is talks aimed at a new deal to keep Iran from getting nuclear weapons. If Iran wants to become a wealthy nation again, become a prosperous nation, we'll call it, let's make Iran great again. Does that make sense? Make Iran great again. Iran insists that the drone it shot down was flying over its airspace. The United States says it was clearly not flying over Iranian airspace, but international airspace. Uh, and the U.S. has expected George to present evidence to that effect later today before the U.N. Security Council. And, and John, Iran now threatening to start restart their nuclear program. Of course, North Korea has a nuclear arsenal right now. The president's continuing to try to cultivate Kim Jong-un. Uh, he sure is. We learned that he uh, sent another letter. They've been having this back and forth with letters. Uh, the president sent another personal letter to Kim Jong-un. The North Korean uh, news agency there released that photograph of Kim Jong-un reading the letter. And George, listen to how uh, they characterized it. They said, the letter is of excellent content ex and, and talked about the extraordinary courage of President Trump, saying that Kim Jong-un would, quote, seriously contemplate the interesting content of that letter. Of course, the big question is, will there be yet another summit? And, wh and what is that content? They know we don't. John Carl, thanks very much. Okay, George, we've got another headline out of Washington this morning. It's the battle over immigration in some of those detention centers holding children as young as two months old. Witnesses who have been inside are, not, are now using words like torture to describe the conditions there. This as President Trump is putting on hold his plan for nationwide deportation raids, at least temporarily. Our senior congressional correspondent Mary Bruce joins us from Capitol Hill. Mary, you've learned that Speaker Nancy Pelosi got in his ear on this one. Yes, Cecilia, the speaker personally lobbied the president not to go through with this, and he is holding off for now, but he's also trying to up the pressure here on Capitol Hill, giving lawmakers just two weeks to act on immigration, or else he says he will go ahead with those sweeping raids. But the pressure is also growing on the president now to do something about what is being described to us as absolutely dire conditions at these facilities along the border. This morning, President Trump's mass deportation operation on hold, but not off the table. Just hours before ICE agents began nationwide raids to round up families who are in the U.S. illegally, Trump tweeted at the request of Democrats, I have delayed the illegal immigration removal process for two weeks. 
ABC News has learned the president called off the sweeping raids after a phone call with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She urged him not to go through with it, calling the raids heartless and warning they would inject terror into our communities. Trump's about face comes as Congress this week will consider a plan to send $4.5 billion in humanitarian aid to the border, where a record number of families are now being detained. The facilities overwhelmed. This felt worse than jail. Speaking exclusively to ABC's Lana Zak, Dr. Dolly Severe says children are are being held in conditions she called inhumane, comparable to torture facilities. The conditions at these facilities are placing them at increased risk for infection, disease, and death. Severe was granted access to the Ursula facility in McAllen, Texas, seen here in these government images taken last year after a flu outbreak there sent five infants to intensive care. There, she says she witnessed a complete lack of basic sanitation, babies drinking from unwashed bottles for days, bright fluorescent lights on 24-7. Attorney Warren Binford, who interviewed children at this facility in Clint, Texas, says children are left to care for each other. They're sleeping on concrete blocks. There are open toilets in the room. There is no soap. These children are being held in a completely inappropriate facility. But when asked about the conditions, the president blamed Democrats. We're doing a fantastic job under the circumstances. The Democrats aren't even approving giving us money. Where is the money? You know what? The Democrats are holding up the humanitarian aid. Now we asked Customs and Border Patrol to respond, and they tell us they have limited resources, but, quote, work to provide the best care possible for those in their custody, especially children, and they insist that they take all allegations of civil rights abuses or mistreatment very seriously. Michael. All right, thank you so much, Mary. And now to new developments in that tragic plane crash in Hawaii. 11 people killed when their skydiving plane went down shortly after takeoff. ABC's Will Carr has the latest on the investigation. Heartbreak in Hawaii after 11 people died in a terrifying plane crash. We saw a big explosion and then just covered in black smoke. That fateful flight took off on a skydiving adventure at sunset, but something instantly went wrong. There's nothing we could have done. There was nothing left. There wasn't a sign of anybody in that plane. ABC News has learned the pilot was 42-year-old Jerome Rank, a French citizen and a father whose brother says he will be sorely missed by anyone who's ever met him. This morning, we're learning the plane was also involved in a previous mid-air incident. This video shows the same aircraft in 2016 filled with skydivers. According to the NTSB, the pilot lost control. See those skydivers falling forward and then bailing out after the plane stalled and went into a dangerous spin. Piece of the plane fell off in midair. I saw something fall down from the plane, like a, a sheet or something. I don't know what it was. Amazingly, nobody was hurt, but the plane sustained serious damage. We will be looking at the quality of those repairs and whether it was inspected and whether it was airworthy. At least six of the victims worked for the Oahu Parachute Center. Larry Lamaster was a father. His family says he would never want one person to waste a single minute of their life mourning his. Casey Williamson was a videographer who went to Hawaii to skydive and follow his adventurous heart. And friends say Michael Martin lived to skydive. And we're really hearing that about so many of the victims. The pilot of the plane was supposed to turn 43 today, and the crew, we're learning, really loved to skydive and had a real zest for adventure. George. Boy, such a tragedy. Okay, thanks very much. To the race for the White House now, Democratic candidate Pete Buttigieg off to a fast start, but now facing a firestorm in his own community. The mayor of South Bend, Indiana, was confronted by angry residents after the fatal shooting of a black man by a white police officer. Our chief national affairs correspondent Tom Yamas here with the story. Good morning, Tom. George, good morning to you. And you will remember when you sat down with Mayor Pete right here in GMA, he said he was qualified to run for president because he's dealt with tough issues in the past, like racially sensitive officer involved shootings. Well, it's happened again in his city, and this time the tension is mounting. Get the people that are racist off the street. This morning, Mayor Pete Buttigieg trying to balance a city on edge with his quest to be president. I don't want on Sunday, facing outraged residents in his hometown of South Bend, Indiana. The meeting called to address the shooting death of Eric Logan by a white police officer. 
Buttigieg remaining calm, even while being constantly interrupted by fired up constituents. That is their last day on the street. I would love to be able to finish my reply if that's okay. Another unit here got through a knife at me. The officer claims Logan, who was allegedly breaking into cars, had a knife and ignored repeated demands to drop it. But the officer didn't activate his body cam. I don't Thank you, fear nobody. Now, residents are demanding action. The Democratic candidate coming off the campaign trail to answer questions. Logan's mother even confronting the mayor in front of cameras. I've been to hell all my life. What's and y'all ain't doing a damn thing about me or my son or none of these people out here. It's time for you to do something. If you can't do it, step your ass down. And I'm tired of talking now. And I'm tired of hearing your lies. Right. Amen. We asked Buttigieg about his city's brewing tensions and his leadership. Home and these issues aren't easy. Part of how you earn your paycheck as a mayor is to walk into no-win situations. But we've done a lot of work. We've got a lot of work to do together. And the timing of this critical issue for his city is tricky. He insists his campaign for president will go on, telling reporters yesterday he plans to participate in this week's debate and continue to serve his community to the best of his ability. But guys, he's three days away from that first primary debate. Incredibly important. It's likely to come up in the debate. Oh, no Certainly. question about that. A real test for a young candidate. Right. Tom, thanks very Tensions. much. Hi there, Tom. Thanks. We'll turn now to another accident at the baseball field. A fan at Dodger Stadium hit in the head by a foul ball. This latest incident once again raising safety questions about extended netting. ABC's Paula Ferris is here with more. Good morning, Paula. And good morning, Cecilia. It happened just beyond the dugout and just beyond that protective netting, raising the question whether Major League Baseball is doing enough to protect its fans. One, two comes home and Bellinger rifles it foul. Another baseball fan hospitalized after being struck by a ball. It happened Sunday afternoon. A line drive hit by Los Angeles Dodgers slugger Cody Bellinger striking a woman during the first inning in their matchup against the Colorado Rockies. The fan who was seated four rows from the field and outside the protective netting was immediately treated in the stands, but 15 minutes later was seen headed to the hospital for further testing. This incident coming just one month after this little girl was struck in the face at a Cubs game. The four-year-old fan hit by Chicago's Albert Almora Jr.'s foul ball. The stadium watching in horror. AJ, um, I mean, you've got some guys that everybody's high on down there. And that one went sizzling yeah. off into the stands. An emotional Almora had to be comforted by a stadium security guard. But these incidents are now raising questions about protective netting at baseball games. According to Major League Baseball, as of last year, all 30 team stadiums are required to have protective netting that extends from behind home plate to the end of each dugout. Both the woman and the little girl were sitting just outside that shielded area. And last month, the Chicago White Sox became the first MLB team to announce they are extending the netting all the way to the foul posts. The Nationals are taking similar steps, but it's up to each team to determine what they want to do beyond the dugout netting. Should be safety first. Absolutely. And I think the players would agree with you on that one. Okay, Paula, thanks very much. We have some exclusive behind the scenes moments you didn't see from that thrilling high wire rock right here in Times Square. Nick and Liana Walenda are here live. It's first on GMA. Also this morning, the hot air balloon crash caught on camera. The passenger now speaking out what she says the pilot did right to avoid a catastrophe. But first, let's go back over to Ginger. And more images of severe storms. It's like we couldn't even fit all of them because this is what was happening in Ellsworth, Kansas. You can see the hail taking over the roads and the cars there. Well, you could see that tomorrow in northern Missouri, Des Moines over to Peoria, Illinois. So I showed you the one today. Of course, tomorrow we're going to have it again. Your local weather in 30 seconds. First, though, the Select Cities sponsored by Febreze Air Effects. She's doing it again. No cover up spray here. It's the irresistibly fresh scent of Febreze Air Effects. Cheaper aerosols can cover up odors, bearing the smell in a flowery fog. Switch to Febreze Air Effects. Febreze eliminates even the toughest odors from the air, and it uses an all natural propellant to leave behind a pleasant scent you'll love. Use anywhere odors can spread. Freshen up. Don't cover up. Febreze Air Effects. 
Today will be the coolest day out of the work week. Temperatures just slightly above average, but we'll be on storm watch for today. Chance of some afternoon storms uh, from 2 o'clock until about 7. Then we could have another round overnight. So plenty warm and a bit sticky today. And then it's all about the heat for the rest of the work week. Our second heat wave of the season, 90s and higher, looking like Thursday being the hottest out of the bunch at 95 degrees with some uh, slightly high humidity. Your next storm chance after that Saturday. The Willendas are here live. We'll be right back. What would I say to somebody living with HIV? Keep being you. Keep loving.